All right, so let's get started. We'll remind you that we are recording this session. It'll be posted on Blackboard a little bit later on in case you wanted to take a look at it. So we're going to kind of double back and talk a little bit about, you know, the big thing that you're looking at when you've identified a patient that is having an MI and how you will going how you're going to treat them. So let's do a little bit of review on oxygen therapy. Do all MI patients get oxygen? What are the two reasons why they not all patients get oxygen? That's one, nitrogen washout and? Say it again. Free radicals, okay? Remember, nitrogen washout causes vasoconstriction. We can make our patients MI worse, and we can neutralize the effect of any nitroglycerin that we're going to give our patient. Free radicals come into play here, and... It can also make our patients MI worse by increasing the, the uh, damage that's done to the lining of the artery that's already affected and make that clot even bigger, okay? So who gets oxygen? Give me one criteria. So we've got respiratory distress. Martina? Someone less than 94%, not 94% and less, but like you said, less than 94%. Aziz, what's the other one? Uh, they're having trouble. So that, that would be Collins. His, he said respiratory distress, but what would be the, what would be the third one? Anybody? They just simply, add, they simply tell you. We, we take their word for it. And uh, they say, I, I don't feel like I can catch my breath, or I feel short of breath. Then we're going to start them on oxygen. Depending upon the severity of the dyspnea is where we're going to start administration of oxygen. If a patient's having just a little bit of respiratory distress, Rihanna, if their SpO2 is like 92, 93 percent, we're going to start them with a nasal cannula and then we can ramp up from there. If our patient is tripoding and they're sweating and they're, they're gulping for air, you can go straight to a non-rebreather, okay? A non-rebreather is basically going to be somewhere between 10 to 15 liters per minute or keep that bag inflated, all right? So that's going to be our oxygen therapy. Get your IV started as soon as you can. Now, ideally, what I would tell you is that when you start your IV, try to get an 18 in, if at all possible, with a short needle. Why? Okay, what does the length of the needle have to do with it, or the length of the catheter? Yeah, so the longer, we can get some, some catheters that are upwards of two, two and a quarter inches, okay? Don't use those. Don't, that, that's, that, those are hard to get into a patient. Just don't, don't use those. So use the shortest catheter that you have, because remember, we're going to be giving some medicines, Lewis, that may potentially drop our patient's blood pressure by doing what? Causing vasodilation. And what we want to do is we want to be able to fill the, the, the container up if their pressure begins to, to drop down. And we want to do that rather quickly. So start with an 18 if you can. Now, sometimes you'll look at a patient and you'll go, Danny, there's no way I can get an 18 in that patient. You go with whatever you can get. Okay, an IV, regardless of the size of your catheter, a good patent IV is better than one that you wish that you could start. So if you have to go with a 20 or 22, that's fine. Go with whatever you're able to, to get. Aspirin. Aspirin is, and Taki brought up a really good question. He said, is this the order in which we're going to do these things? And the answer is no. And actually... Aspirin should be the first drug that you administer to your patients. Why? You're right. So it takes about 15 minutes to go in, and we know that aspirin is what the general public calls a blood thinner. That's not what it does at all, but it is a platelet aggregate inhibitor, okay? Platelet aggregate means it makes it not sticky. Inhibitor means it makes it not sticky. So in essence, in giving that aspirin to our patient, now what we're able to do is that we can actually begin to reverse 
and to diminish the size of the clot that is already there, okay? So we can't completely remove the clot. Aspirin's not nearly strong enough for that. And we don't give aspirin for pain relief, the pain that they're having, Danny, with, uh, with an MI. It's too, too much. So we, we've got to either go with nitroglycerin or, as we'll talk about, we'll, we'll go with a narcotic here in just a minute. But the other thing to keep in mind, and you should never, ever have this, but you may see this on a, on a question, don't give enteric-coated aspirin. Now, what did we say enteric-coated aspirin is? It can be a capsule, okay, and it has a specialized coating that extends that onset from 15 minutes up to about an hour and a half, okay? And so basically it's for people that have uh, aspirin therapy, chronic aspirin therapy or long-term aspirin therapy, that gives them a stomach discomfort, and so it moves it on into the intestinal tract where there are fewer nerve endings and therefore less discomfort. Let's say that you're with a friend, okay, and they begin having chest pain, and all they have is enteric-coated aspirin. Are you going to give that? Why? You're right. Now tell me why you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to tell these patients, chew and chew and chew and chew, and you grind that up until there's nothing left, and when there's nothing left, then you swallow it. So you are definitely going to do that. And again, the aspirin is going to be the most important drug that you're going to give. So you want to get that on board as soon as possible. As long as what? They're not allergic, they're not allergic to it. Uh, or they're not in the process. Because you could potentially have a patient that's having an asthma attack that would precipitate a heart attack. If they're having an asthma attack, are you going to give aspirin? Probably not because it's only going to make the asthma attack worse. That's actually what's going to kill them first is hypoxia, all right? Nitroglycerin. Did we talk about right-sided MIs in here? Okay, so again, nitroglycerin comes in. It's a vasodilator. We want nitroglycerin to be given as early as possible. Again, and I want, I'm not even going to ask this. This is just me, me telling you the way that it is. Do not let, when you go out on your, on your, uh, your, your field internship, obviously you may work with some paramedics that will say, oh, he's having an inferior wall MI. We can't give nitroglycerin. In that situation, you are a guest in their house. You smile and you nod and you think, oh, what a goober you are, because that's incorrect. We can give nitroglycerin Right-sided MI is a relative contraindication. It all depends on what their blood pressure is, okay? So we want to get nitro on board so that we can now begin to get vasodilation. And number one, it helps to relieve pain. But even more importantly than that, it helps to restore some blood flow. Because remember, time is muscle. The longer you wait to restore blood flow, the long or the more damage that you're going to have. And if when you have a certain critical mass of damage in the patient's heart, now what's going to happen is it's either number one, going to lead to their death, which is the worst, or number two, reduce their quality of life. Okay, so we want to get that open as soon as we possibly can. Go with morphine or fentanyl. Let me ask you a question. And we talked about both morphine and fentanyl to a certain, certain degree. If you carry both on your ambulance, which one are you going to use? That was quick. Why would you use fentanyl? Okay. So say what again, again what you said, Colin? It, it, it does not affect the blood pressure as much as does morphine. You're exactly right. Lewis, what, were your, what was your rationale? Yeah, so it has a much shorter half-life. So if you've got a patient, and remember, they're both narcotics. If you have to reverse it, if your patient goes into respiratory arrest, and you got to reverse it, they'll both be reversed with Narcan. Now, you may have to give more Narcan for the fentanyl because it's a much more powerful drug. But remember, with morphine, we're giving it in milligrams in 
fentanyl, we're giving it to them in micrograms. So we're giving them a much smaller amount to get the same, uh, same therapy. And then lastly, electrical therapy, depending upon what's going on with the patient. And we'll talk more specifically about this because what we're going to do is we're transitioning it from into this part, we're actually going to begin to integrate the different ACLS algorithms. So we'll have one week that we'll talk about tachycardias. We'll have one week that we'll talk about ventricular rhythms and so on like that, and what the treatment will be for them. Within almost all of those categories, electrical therapy would be an option. We can use electrical therapy when the heart rate is too fast, Rihanna. We can use electrical therapy when the heart rate is too slow. We can also use electrical therapy when there's no organized action to try to shock it back into a particular type of rhythm that we've got going on here. All right, now come on, work with me. All right. Let me get be on my notes. Okay. Now, that is for acute coronary syndrome. That's kind of an overall overarching look. Now, we'll look at that a little bit more in detail later on. What we're doing right now is we're kind of taking a survey course of different types of conditions. Any questions on, on an MI, acute coronary syndrome? Let's talk about heart failure, okay? Because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to prevent your patient from progressing into heart failure. Heart failure is defined as what? Don't just tell me the title or the words that I just used. What is heart failure? Bless you. Pardon? It's a pump. Excuse me. It's a pump problem. You're exactly right. The pump no longer is efficient in ejecting blood. Rihanna, what's the number one cause of a pump problem in the human? MI. Very good. Yeah. So having an MI destroys tissue. Remember, again, that's why I said a minute ago, time is muscle. And the more muscle, cardiac muscle, that the patient loses the greater the possibility that they will have to be treated for heart failure. Heart failure can often be a progressive type of disease. Now, don't misunderstand heart failure with COPD. You'll have some similar types of situations or similar types of symptoms. COPD can indeed lead to heart failure, okay, in particular when we see with emphysema. But emphysema is almost exclusively caused by cigarette smoking, okay? But your patient that has heart failure will often have some similar uh, symptoms as what we would see with, with emphysema. So basically, it's just like Devin said. The heart is so badly damaged, again, primarily because of an MI, that it can no longer function well enough to meet the metabolic demands of the heart. Now, there's two types of heart failure. We have left side and we have right side. Both of them have to do with a pump problem. Now, when we have, think about this now. Okay, so the, the blood is coming into the left ventricle, okay? And it gets pumped out to the what? It goes out to the aorta and it goes out to the body. Where does the blood come from that's coming into the left ventricle. It's coming from the lungs, all right? When the left ventricle begins to fail, this is where we begin to see that backup of fluid, Bella, that goes into the lungs. And primarily that fluid is constituted of what? What makes up the fluid that we would see in pulmonary edema in our heart failure patient? You're not, Bella. Plasma. Plasma is correct, all right? Now, again, we can see sometimes we can see specks of red if the patient has a cough with this. This is one of the similarities that you will see with patients that have um, emphysema. Sometimes they will also have fluid in their lungs 
And again, that's because their emphysema is leading to their heart failure. But those red specks that you're seeing are small red blood cells that move across the alveoli and into the, into the patient's sputum that comes into, into play there. The number one cause of left-sided heart failure is what? MI, okay? So again, that's going to be the thing that we're looking at. Now there are other causes that can come into play here, but about 75% of the primary cause of heart failure is going to be heart failure or left, left ventricular pump failure. What do you think would be some other causes of left-sided heart failure. Think about the mechanics that's going on. Remember, this is a this is a pumping problem. Aziz? Chronic high blood pressure. Which leads to what? You're right. Chronic high blood pressure is the instigating problem that leads to what from a mechanical perspective within the heart? which would cause failure of what? Not the left ventricle, I'll tell you that. The right? Not the right, we'll, we'll come to the right in a minute. When, when the blood comes back, does it come directly into the left ventricle? No, where does it come? Where does it go? It goes into the left atria, and then it goes down into the left ventricle. What's in between the atria and the ventricle? Yeah. So if we have a patient with chronic, uncontrolled blood pressure, it can lead to failure of tricuspid or, or, or bicuspid valve. Bicuspid valve, which causes a backup of blood. So, say it again. Yeah, backup of blood that goes into the um, into the alveoli, and it's primarily going to be plasma part of the blood that, that moves into there. So we can actually have a a, a failure of a of a valve. That's a relatively simple problem to fix, Miriam. They can go in and they can either put in an implanted valve. I haven't kept on it up with it, but in the past, one of the things that they've done is they've used pig valves to go in and put that in. Uh, other places, they will go in and they'll put in a plastic or even a medical metal artificial valve. Uh, the first time I ever heard a patient with a metal artificial valve, it just literally blew my mind because normally when we're listening to the heart, we hear lub dub, lub dub, and that's the sound of the valves closing. That's exactly what you're hearing. What I heard whenever this patient had this artificial valve was love click, love click, love click, and it literally sounded like two pieces of metal hitting it against themselves, which in essence is exactly what was happening with that valve, okay? And so when you're, when you're doing that, that's something that can be fixed much easier than dead heart tissue. Colin, do you have a question? Okay, so again, the big thing that we're looking at and we're concerned about with left-sided heart failure is going to be uh, a, a patient that is going to have an MI. Now, what causes right-sided heart failure? Very good. The most common cause of left-sided heart failure is right-sided heart failure. Why? What backs up? Which does what? Very good. Yep, you're exactly right. So in essence, what we've got here is that we have this backup of fluid into the, the lungs, okay? Remember, the arterial system can dilate to a point, uh, uh, Bella. But when the arterial system can no longer dilate enough, or if the arterial system, the pulmonary arteries are damaged and they can't dilate at all, what changes? Blood pressure goes up. 
That is known as pulmonary hypertension. So when pulmonary hypertension goes up and we get blockage into the lungs, into the alveoli, and in particular, what, what part of the vasculature is actually having the hypertension within the lungs? When we talk about pulmonary hypertension. Capillaries. capillaries. Yeah. So these capillaries are engorged. They're backed up. They're full of blood. And they either cannot dilate because of disease or they've dilated to their max. Now what happens is that pressure is sent on back into the right side of the heart. Okay. And so that causes right-sided heart failure. And so if the primary sign or symptom of a patient that has left-sided heart failure is going to be pulmonary edema, what's the primary thing that we're going to see with right-sided heart failure? Say it again. Not, not primary, but you will see JVD, especially when it gets really, really bad. Pitting edema in the lower extremities. So that's why when you're dealing with any patient that's having any type of a cardiac or respiratory problem, look at their feet, okay? That's one of the things that we don't do really well as, as paramedics is that we don't do an entire assessment. Looking at their feet can give you a ton of information. The other thing that can cause right-sided heart failure all by itself, without affecting the left side, is a pulmonary embolism. Remember, what is a pulmonary embolism? Yeah, and basically what we're talking about is we're talking about a larger blood vessel than the capillaries. And so, again, when you have that blockage, you're still having enough fluid that, or enough blood that's able to circulate around it, much like we would see a partial blockage within the heart. But eventually that begins to back up. And again, it's not going to back up over here to the left ventricle. It's instead going to back up over here to the right ventricle. So it is possible to have right-sided heart failure and yet have no left-side involvement whatsoever. Here's the problem. Well, actually, you tell me. What would be the problem if you have right-sided heart failure but you don't have left-sided heart failure? Say it again. Not necessarily. As a result of what? Which, not to the rest of the body, but to the heart itself. And we call that, ladies and gentlemen, before cardiac output. We have, we call that starts with a P, ends with a reload. Preload. Preload, okay? So when we reduce the preload, all right? You guys are going to get tired of hearing me talk about preload and afterload, but it's an important concept. If preload is reduced as a result of right-sided heart failure by itself coming from a pulmonary embolism, then basically what we're going to see is that the patient's quality of life is still going to be negatively impacted. Is that right? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so when we're looking at this, and, I've, and, and this is a slide I've used for a number of, or the slide deck is one that I've used for a number of years. Sometimes I will slip up and call it congestive heart failure, but generally we just call it heart failure. Whatever you want to call it, I don't care. I don't care. So basically what happens is within heart failure, just like we said, we begin to get edema somewhere. It could be potentially in the alveoli, and or it could be in the, uh, the lower extremities. Now, here's the thing that's important to remember. When you're doing an assessment on your patient, all right, keep in mind that some of your patients have a chronic heart failure history. And beneath what they're going to be doing, doing is they're going to be confined to a bed. And generally what we see with hospital beds is that the head is elevated and the feet are slightly elevated. You're not going to see pedal edema down here. Why? Because it doesn't, it's not like the salmon. They don't go upstream. So, so the, the pedal edema is actually going to drain down to the lowest part of their body, 
which is actually most likely going to be the lumbar sacral area of the back. So when you're moving your patient over, make sure that you are assessing for edema uh, landing in the lower part of the back. That gives you lots of good, good information. Now, the other thing that we're looking at here is that you can identify the seriousness of um, heart failure by palpating the abdomen as well. How might we be able to do that? Yeah, so if we palpate the, did I cover this? Oh, good grief, okay, my apologies. Anyway, palpate the lever, if it squirts back up into the into the jugular veins, then your your is, is going to be fairly serious. Okay, your assessment. Focus in on your chief complaint. Okay, these patients will often have respiratory distress as just part of their normal daily living. Okay, they're never not short of breath. Find out is their dyspnea worse today and by how much. Look at and find out if they've had acute weight gain. So for example, um, these patients will often be on a salt restricted diet and uh, they will try to, uh, physicians will try to keep their total uh, intake of salt to less than two grams per day. I don't know if anybody in here has ever been on a two gram sodium diet, but it's terrible. I mean, you might as well not eat because, I mean, we're, we just, we like salt. Uh, uh, here in, in Western culture, we, we like salt. What about Saudi Arabia folks? Do, do you guys eat a lot of salt too? Yeah. Okay. So it's a human thing. Okay, good. Bonds us together. So it's a human thing. And, and so generally what you will often see is that you will get a call for a patient that has acute respiratory distress. And when you're talking to them, not only as part of your um, your patient or getting your history, don't even don't only ask them about what their last oral intake was. Find out what they've eaten in the last twenty four hours. Many times these patients will say, um, "I had my favorite Mexican uh, meal, or I had pizza, or I had potato chips." What's that? Especially the corn dogs, okay? Especially the corn dogs, okay? Or any kind of, of hot dog. Uh, that's going to be really, really high in, in sodium. Generally, when I was on the road on a regular basis, I saw a huge influx of acute onset respiratory distress in patients on the Friday, Saturday after Thanksgiving. It's just a high salt meal, you know? And it's, it's a special day. Family's there and we eat. And so I would see these patients that would have sudden onset of respiratory distress with an increase in their pulmonary edema, as well as their ankles would be like, like that. Here's the thing that's really important. Some of you guys, as you progress in your careers, you're going to go into community paramedicine. Community paramedicine is really pretty cool. We're looking at actually adding a degree track in that here. And one of the prime things that community paramedicine does is that it tries to keep patients with long-term chronic illnesses like heart failure out of the hospital because it saves the hospital money and it saves the patient money. And it also reduces the amount of expense that the ambulance has. So one of the things that you'll be doing, some of you, uh, will be you'll be going and seeing your patients. It's much like home health. And the way that I like to say it is that it's that intersection between home health, which is typically a long-term relationship, and EMS, community paramedicine, which is usually about 28 days. Because this is all driven by insurance, and the biggest insurer in, in, in America today is Medicare. Medicare says to a hospital, if your patient comes back in for the same diagnosis that you discharged your patient from in 28 days, we ain't paying you nothing and you still have to provide the care, okay? You have to provide the care. Plus, if you hit a certain threshold of this, we're gonna find you. So community paramedicine is one of the ways that that is done. Many times the EMS agencies will partner with hospitals to pay for the salary of their community paramedics. So anyway, 
you will go out and you will assess these patients. You'll, you'll take in, instead of taking in a jump bag with a defibrillator, you'll still have all your ALS equipment, but you'll take in a pair of scales, weight scales, and you'll take in an ISTAT and you'll take in your blood pressure cuff. You'll go in and you'll assess these patients. Generally what you'll see, do is you'll go in and you'll see them for about an hour, uh, every uh, about twice a week or maybe even three times a week, depending on what the doctor calls for. You will weigh them. You will track their weight. And if you see a patient that has gained 10, 15 pounds, which is entirely possible when we eat a lot of salt over the period of about 48 hours, now we got to do something. We got to change that out. So maybe we will help increase the patient's Lasix. We'll talk about uh, diuretics a little bit later on in here, and then we'll hit it even harder for those of you that are in, in 225. So the big thing that we want to do is we want to watch for our patient's weight gain. That's going to be a, cre a key criteria of doing that. And your patients are going to know. They're going to know if they have retained water for that. So look at their medicines. Again, Begin making a list of medicines you're not familiar with. Use Hippocrates. If you found another pocket guide that's on your phone that you like better than Hippocrates, use it. But begin, Sydney, to become familiar with these different classes of medicines because new ones are being put out every single week. Danny, there's no way that you and I can keep up with medicines. I got physicians that I will go and see and they'll say, I'm not familiar with that medicine, let me look it up. Well, you know, if they've got all this additional training and residency and specialization and they can't keep up with medicine, why should I be expected? So use your pocket guides as they're appropriate. Be really, really good about assessing the, the, the quality of how they're breathing. Not only how fast they're breathing, Landon, but look at their tidal volume. Listen to breath sounds. Begin to listen to breath sounds on everybody you transport. In your labs, guys, begin listening to breath sounds on each other. One of the things, I don't know if you'll use it or not, but one of the things that we've got is that when you get into 360 in the, in the spring, we'll begin doing some simulations. And we've got a stethoscope in there that will, well, actually we've got several, we've got three of them, that will simulate any kind of breath sound that we we want to we want to do. I can remember we had a had a, a, a couple students that were married to each other, and uh, I told the the one student what I was going to do, and I gave it to uh, to his wife and said, "Hey, go over and listen to your husband's breath sounds." And when she went over to listen to his breath sounds, I had him in really really bad pulmonary edema, and just to see her eyes because she thought it was just a regular stethoscope, just to see her eyes bug out. And so it's that realistic. So we will begin doing that with not only breath sounds, but also heart tones. So assess your patient's breathing and then go in and, and look at that. If you get called in the middle of the night with a patient that reports of a sudden onset of shortness of breath, that is known as paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, okay? Paroxysmal just simply means a sudden onset. I think we have a rhythm that has paroxysmal in it, don't we? What is it? Yeah, PSVT. And in PSVT, you see what? Good, Devin. Starts or stops. Okay, SVT that you see start or stop. With, with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or PND, your patients go to bed at night, they're doing fine, and then they wake up in the middle of the night, and usually their respiratory distress, Sydney, is really, really severe, bordering on respiratory failure. So you gotta be aggressive. You gotta get in and you gotta address your patient's respiratory status really, really quickly. Let me ask you a question. You should know that Administration of nitroglycerin will cause venous pooling. Can we utilize nitroglycerin in the case of a patient that has PND, which leads to severe pulmonary edema? Yes or no? And then defend your answer. Why no? Then rushing that fluid straight up, especially if you don't get caught in pulmonary edema from it. 
Okay. Okay. I see your rationale. Okay. Anybody want to go with yes? Or is everybody else just afraid of Lewis? He's not that scary. I'm afraid. I'm with you. You're afraid? I got one with So I would tell you, depending upon the patient's blood pressure, I would probably give it. Why? Because you have within the heart itself a rather large area on the back side of the heart known as the coronary sinus. And that's where when we had this venous pooling. That's where that blood is going to collect. Now, if that blood were to stay there for days, that's not going to be a good thing. Because remember, blood that sits, clots. But it's not. And so what it does is it, it gently, it doesn't pull. It's not a diuretic. So it does not pull the, med or pull the fluid out of the lungs. But what it does do is it allows kind of a holding area that now will keep that pulmonary edema from getting worse. And because of gravity, because let's face it, your patients in, in pulmonary edema are going to be just like this. But because of gravity, now it will begin to backflow and it will help your patient. Now, obviously, there are some, you, you want to look at the contraindications for the administration of nitro. If any of those exist, you may or may not want to give it. If you have any concerns about should I give it or should I not, you pick up your radio, you pick up your phone, and you call med control. Call it. The problem with um, pulmonary edema is not bronchoconstriction. So the bronchioles are fine. And we don't even really have inflammation that is in there. The problem with pulmonary edema is that the alveoli are full of fluid. So if you, it, now you might want to consider giving a patient a NEB treatment if they have a history of asthma. But if they have pulmonary edema and they have asthma, now what's going to be your concern about giving a NEB treatment? Mm-hmm. If you got a patient that has a history of asthma and they have heart failure and they're in pulmonary edema, what's going to be your concern about giving a NEB treatment? What's that got to do with the price of eggs? Mm -hmm. More strain on the heart. Now, I'm not telling you not to give a NEB treatment because remember, you got to treat what's going to heal your patient first. Your patient is most likely going to crash if you don't get the respiratory system fixed. So they'll go from respiratory distress to failure to arrest, okay? Much quicker than what they would normally do if you've got a patient that is in heart failure and now they go into cardiac arrest. That's one of those situations where you're going to go, okay, what do I do? I'm in charge. This is why I'm getting paid the big bucks. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and, and you have to make the decision what's in the best interest of the patient. Wish I had a formula that I could give you to say, every time this happens, this is a formula that you're using, you'll never go wrong. I don't have one, and trust me, there will be times when you will make the wrong decision. Welcome to the human race. Okay? Good. So when we're looking, yes, please. Go right ahead. CPAP in heart failure and pulmonary edema as a result of heart failure. Okay. Good question. Are you going to use CPAP with pulmonary edema for the patient that's in heart failure? Okay. Would you go with BiPAP? Say it again now. Okay, so you're, you're starting to talk like me. The answer is, it depends. Okay, first thing you want to do is you want to assess your patient's hemodynamic status. Okay, remember, if your patient has fluid in the lungs, they're not getting good oxygenation. 
And eventually, what is that going to do to the cardiovascular system? It's going to die. And how are you going to know that your cardiovascular system is in the process of dying? And? Say it again. And? And? Yeah. So you're going to have, your patient's going to have signs and symptoms of shock. Should you put a patient on CPAP slash and or BiPAP if they got a blood pressure of 90 over 60? Why not? Yeah, Taki, very good. Yeah, so we, in, remember, one of the side effects of CPAP and BiPAP is just what you said. We're filling up these big lungs here. It's squishing the heart. That's a technical medical term. Squishing the heart, reducing, my favorite word, preload. Okay, so it's reducing preload. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. So it reduces preload, which is going to make our patient's shock state even worse. So again, the question that you asked about CPAP and BiPAP is, it depends. You got a good patient with good blood pressure? Go for it. May the force be with you. Absolutely. Give them CPAP because it will help to push the fluid, increasing the, the, the pressure in the alveoli, and it'll move the pressure or move the fluid out of the alveoli back into the vasculature where it belongs. But if you got a patient that's in cardiogenic shock, don't do that. You, you won't be able to defend that at, at all. Yeah. Now, it is possible for your patient to start out with a good solid hemodynamic state and then through the course of using CPAP, BiPAP for them to begin to crash. In that situation, you just take them off of it, document what happened, and now you're protected as having done the right thing for the patient. All right? Say it again. And monitor their blood pressure. That's the nice thing about monitors today, you know. You kids and your fancy dancy monitors. When in my day we used to monitor patients and have to carry it uphill both ways in the snow in July, but now all you got to do is push a button and it, you tell it how often to take a blood pressure, and that's exactly what you should what you should be be doing, Devin. I was about to say you're welcome. All right, again, watch your patients with P and D. Um, Again, much like I talk about with unstable angina, awaking your patient from sleep at night, you can't be in a more relaxed, less oxygen demand state than when you're sleeping. If there's something going on, Sydney, that your patient has awakened now, now you got to look at your patient really, really closely. And this is a this is a serious patient. You want to go through and, and you take care of that. What, Martina? Oh, okay. You got to move when the spirit hits you, okay? Again, labor breathing is the most common sign that you're going to see with your patients with heart failure, okay? Pulmonary edema will be also very, very uh, common. As I said before, it's not unusual for your patients to be leaning forward and in a tripod position, having to have some. Some, some distress. The other thing that you need to assess on your patients that have a history of heart failure is how many, how many pillows are you sleeping on? Now, here's kind of where if you had to choose the lesser of two evils to choose between heart failure and emphysema, choose heart failure because from Lifestyle modification and medication, you can stop heart failure pretty much from progressing. Once you've been identified with emphysema, it is a progressive disease that will only end when you die. Okay, now it may take a long time. For example, Leonard Nimoy, who played the original Spock on the, on the, the original television series, he smoked most of his life until he was 40 years old and he developed COPD, emphysema. Then he stopped smoking. He lived another 25 years. But what killed him 
was emphysema. So once it starts, it is a degenerative disease. And so when you've got your patients that have COPD or heart failure, one of the things you want to ask them is, first of all, how many pillows are you sleeping on at night? Generally, if a patient has more than two pillows, that's a significant finding. Sometimes you will also find patients that will say, I haven't slept in my bed in over a year. And they're sleeping out in the recliner because they cannot lie flat at all or else they begin to have serious trouble breathing. Keep that in mind when you're transporting your patients. Again, if you find your patient in tripod position, don't try to put them on the stretcher for the entire trip in. Move them out from the house on your stretcher and then let them move over to your squad bench, buckle them in, let them resume that tripod position so that the uh, dependent extremities can accumulate some of that fluid. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're just gonna make it more difficult for fluid to come out of the alveoli and go elsewhere. With your patients that have heart failure, they will often have skin color changes. And so with them, most many times, they will look very, very pale uh, because they're beginning to have a reduction in the red blood count. With these patients, when they're in an acute phase, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and works overdrive and they will be very diaphoretic. They will be sweating a lot. And when you're listening to breath sounds, pulmonary edema can be very, very tricky. So pulmonary edema can present as both rails or ronchi, depending upon what. What would make it, now keep in mind, I think I've shared with you at one point in time, most of the time, Danny, when you're talking about ronchi, you're talking about some type of a pulmonary infection. So your patient is usually going to have a cough and they're going to have what else? A fever, okay? But when you have a patient with pulmonary edema, it is possible for you to hear rails or it's possible to hear ronchi. Why would you hear ronchi in a pulmonary edema patient that has no lung infection? Well, now it doesn't have to travel far because remember you're listening to lungs. So you can, typically what you're gonna hear with, with crackles, you're going to hear widespread crackles in multiple places. When you listen for ronchi, you will often only hear it in one part of one lung. So you may hear ronchi here. Actually, as it begins, you're probably going to come closer to hearing ronchi back here than you will be up here. And that's a clue as to why you might hear ronchi with P, pulmonary, don't say PE, that's, that's a pulmonary embolism, but with pulmonary edema and it not be related to an infection. Why would that be? There's just so much fluid in there. That's one thing, got a lot of fluid, got a lot of fluid. What's the other thing? Yeah, you're correct. So these patients will have pulmonary edema as a regular basis. They just have different degrees of pulmonary edema. Now, most of the time, these patients are going to be confined to bed. So again, your patients that are confined to bed are also going to be at a much greater risk for pneumonia. So again, you have to assess your patient for both of them, okay? So what are we going to do? We already kind of covered this, so we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. Let your patient determine how they're going to sit. Let your patient determine what they're going to do in the back of the ambulance. If they're in a tripod position, keep them in a tripod position. One of the things I can guarantee that you, you're not going to do is you're not going to get your patient to lay flat. Even if your patient's got a cervical spine injury and they got numbness and paralysis in their extremities, remember, Treat what's going to kill them first. If you lay them flat, they're going to suffocate. So you're going to have to have spinal motion restriction with your patient sitting upright and not on the backboard. Consider the use of nitroglycerin for your patient. Again, making sure that there's no contraindications that come up within that particular uh, drug. 
as we talked about, CPAP or BiPAP would definitely be something that we would want to consider giving, again, dependent upon the patient's hemodynamic status. Much as Taki said a while ago, if our patient is crashing from a hemodynamic crash, they're going into shock, don't do that. That's just going to speed that process up, and, and you're going to be guilty of a paramedic-assisted death. So you're going to have to, to withhold that. Now, as far as we're looking at CPAP itself, let's look a little bit at the science. So CPAP has been proven to be effective for heart failure. And basically what it does is that when we increase the pressure within the alveoli, we also have an increase in the pulmonary venous system that will push more fluid back into the arteries or the capillaries, the arterioles, and therefore it takes it out of the alveoli. By having either this continuous or this alternating type of pressure that we see with both CPAP and BiPAP, fluid is basically, it's just kind of like you're using a, 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 a you're just kind of blowing up a balloon and you're moving the fluid out of the alveoli, okay? And I've seen many, many times where CPAP has kept a patient off of a ventilator. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with really severe heart failure patients. If, you are, if you're going to RSI your patient, if you feel like that this patient is in failure, and they're moving really quickly into a rest. Now, obviously, if a patient's awake, you're not going to intubate that patient. They're going to fight you. Remember, you got to have your patient positioned, and they can't, they can't be in that position. But if you intubate your patient with a history of heart failure, and they go to the hospital, they're probably going to be put on a ventilator. There's a good, good possibility, especially if they have a long-term history of heart failure, they're not coming off that ventilator which means hundreds of thousands of dollars for your patient and their family, just simply from a, from, a, from a financial perspective. But setting that aside, now that patient has zero quality of life. We've increased the possibility that they're going to die from a nosocomial infection. Nosocomial infections are infections that you would get or the patient would get that they didn't have when they came into the hospital. Hospitals are dirty places, okay? They're no place for a sick person. So when you go into the hospital, especially if you've got some type of respiratory process going on, make sure that you try to use, especially in heart failure patients, that intubation is going to be the tool of last resort. I'm not telling you not to use it. Miriam, there will be times where you will have to intubate your patient or they will die. But that shouldn't be your go-to. That should be your last resort than your first alternative. CPAP. I have seen patients with CPAP that were ready to be intubated. And by the time we got to the hospital, they were laughing and talking and wondering what's for supper. It's just dramatic. And I suspect all y'all that are working in the field right now have seen similar things that have happened as well. So what's the criteria for CPAP? Well, first of all, your patient has to be awake and alert and able to follow commands. Aziz, if they're able to follow commands, that means that they're able to maintain their own airway, and now we don't have to worry about air going into the stomach. Second thing we have to do is that they need to be older than 12 years of age. That's usually not a problem. CPAP almost never is used in pediatric patients, okay? Okay. The next thing we want to do is, uh, again, much like we talked about earlier, we want to make sure that they've got an adequate blood pressure. For use of CPAP, what would you consider an adequate blood pressure? Okay, so I hear 100. Anything else? How much? 90. Anything else? Okay. I would say that you need to have a blood pressure, I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm going to agree with Devin. Let's go. That's of at nice. least 100, at least 100. Why? Because you are going to get some blood pressure drop 
when you use CPAP for the most part. And so if you've got a blood pressure of at least 100, now we're going to be okay. We've got that 10-point buffer to be able to, to maintain good perfusion for our, for our patients. And again, like I said a while ago, one of the things that you need to do, this is true for all of your patients, regardless of the reason that you are giving a patient or, or applying CPAP. They need to be on a BP monitor and the monitor should be taking automatic blood pressures. Probably about every five minutes, Bella, is, is going to be adequate, okay? Track those blood pressures. And in particular, what's more important than tracking the blood pressure? Mental status is important. MAP is important. But even more important, heart rate is very important. But the thing that we're going to be looking at as far as blood pressure is the pulse pressure. Remember, what you want to look at is that when you get that blood pressure, some monitors will, will calculate a pulse pressure for you. I don't think the life pack or the zoles that we typically use in the field do. I may be wrong. But basically, all you do for your pulse pressure is you subtract your systolic from your diastolic, the smaller number from the larger number, and you track that number. If that number is getting bigger or if it stays the same, you're okay. You're okay. If that number is starting to get smaller, that tells us we have a narrowing pulse pressure. And that is even an earlier indication that your patient's blood pressure is dropping, even though you look at a blood pressure and you go, but it's above 100. Bill said it had to be above 100. But if you start out and you're your uh, pulse pressure is going to be like 36, and then the next one's 30, and then the next one is now down to 25. You may want to remove your CPAP and see what happens to your patient's blood pressure when you're when you're doing that. Okay. Uh, if you do take the, uh, the the CPAP off, if your patient is unresponsive at that point in time, then you would want to go ahead and. Uh, begin addressing um, ventilation for your patient. Now, this may be the time when you might have to RSI your patient and to, uh, to innovate them. Now, again, keep in mind, most of the time we talk about RSI, and you'll, you'll learn more about RSI in the summer semester. But most of the time we talk about RSI with a role, with the use of an endotracheal tube. Understand that when you decide to RSI a patient, you're taking away all respiratory effort from the patient completely. So first of all, you need to be confident in your skills to manage the airway. And the only way you can be confident in that is to practice, 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 as well as to understand when you need to back up and go to a less advanced airway, still advanced airway, and going to a less advanced airway, all right? I'm going to stop there because y'all have got the deer in the headlight look on a Monday afternoon, and we'll pick this up on Thursday.